Welcome back to chapter two, where we are finishing up our discussion of the birth of astronomy by talking about how we started to build our understanding of what we now think of as modern astronomy, giving up on some of these unquestionable and incorrect truths from ancient Greece and replacing them with accurate scientific hypotheses. Now, the big linchpin in all of this um, started with Nicholas Copernicus. So he was born in Poland and he trained as a cleric. And this isn't too surprising because if we think back to who was actually doing astronomy and astrology in ancient Egypt and Babylon and um, even Greece, it tended to be people of the priest class. And so he trained as a cleric but was very interested in mathematics and science. And so he developed a heliocentric universe model. Now, at the point when he published it, his idea was not this must be the correct thing. It was much more along the lines of, hey, this is actually a more elegant um, and simpler model that still describes the location of all of the planets and all of the motions that we see, but is easier to understand and has fewer epicycles. It didn't fix everything because he still relied on perfectly uniform circles but it was certainly much more straightforward. And at that point, what that model looked like is all of the six known planets were in the correct order. It's worth commenting that even in ancient um, Greece, we knew about six of our planets. So Mercury and Venus were known, even in the geocentric model, to always act like they were near the sun. The reason for that in reality in the heliocentric, sun-centered model is because they are closer to the sun than we are. But in the ancient Greek model, they were kind of stuck to be in line with the sun. They, they were known to behave differently. Then, of course, Earth. And then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were the only planets that we knew about further away from Earth um, than further away from the sun than the Earth is. The reason why no one knew about Uranus or Neptune or anything else like um, dwarf planets like Pluto is because all of those objects are too faint to be seen by the human eye. We needed telescopes to be able to find them. But the six known planets were in the correct order. Retrograde motion was pretty straightforward. It was just because the further away planets moved slower and the inner planets moved a little bit faster. But the model was not instantly accepted. And again, even, even Copernicus himself wasn't saying this is the only correct answer. He was saying this is a better method. Here's, here's a whole description of it and um, the math behind it. It really took until Galileo picked up that, um, that particular topic that we started to understand um, much more. So Galileo is really one of the most important figures for the idea of what we think of as modern science. The big transition from authority-based science, where you tell me a thing, I believe it, and kind of build from there, to observation-based science. You tell me a thing, I test it to see if that's correct, and then go from there. Galileo's known for a lot of different things. Um, he developed experiments in his workshop, so um, balls on tracks, uh, seeing how things interacted and moved and sped up and slowed down. He figured out how objects would move if there were no friction to slow them down. It's the basis of Isaac Newton's law of inertia. And he figured out how objects accelerate. The linked video here we'll have in um, the playlist. And it's a um, clip from one of the Apollo missions where they dropped a hammer and a feather on the moon. And they talk about Galileo twice in that, um, in that video clip. So it's kind of reminding us of his importance to them. The telescope was not invented by Galileo. That's a common misconception or a common myth. It was invented in Holland around 1608 for use in seeing um, distant ships on the horizon for the most part. When we think of these early, early 1600s telescopes, we really should be thinking of like pirate spyglass kind of telescopes and not what we might have um, a better understanding of for backyard astronomy nowadays. Galileo did hear about them quite quickly and made his own, and he was one of the first, if not the first person, to, instead of look for distant ships on the horizon, look up into the sky. And if you imagine getting a um, telescope as a present, you kind of have this um, list of all of the easiest things to use, use it on. The moon, 
planets, the sun carefully, and that's pretty much what Galileo did. So the first thing that he looked at was the moon, and he um, sketched this out. This picture is from um, Galileo's uh, notebooks, and he was able to recognize, because of the shadow and the light, that the moon has peaks and it has craters. And that's not really surprising for us currently, but at the time in the 1600s, everyone thought that all of these heavenly objects in the sky were all perfect orbs, perfectly spherical um, and smooth objects because they're in the heavens and were put there. The fact is the moon is way more interesting than just a perfect sphere. And he was able to um, see that with his telescope. We also have some other sketches from his notebooks. Um, so number two on this list, the stars too faint to see by eye. The reason why that is so important is because what he did um, in one of the many things when he first got his telescope was just point at a dark part of the sky. That with the human eye, there would be no stars there to look at. And all of a sudden, he can see way more stars. That's his first inclination and our first as a society that the universe is a lot bigger than just what we would call our solar system. Then number three, the moons around Jupiter. This is a day by day um, marking of a circle for the planet Jupiter and a couple of um, little asterisk stars for some of Jupiter's moons. Now this is an extremely important in general because it was the first time anyone had discovered moons around a different planet, not Earth. And it didn't completely solve the sun-centered versus Earth-centered um, back and forth, but it did throw out one of the key arguments that people were using at the time. There were people in the 1500s and 1600s who said the sun cannot possibly be at the center of the solar system because for the moon to go around the earth and the earth to go around the sun, the moon just wouldn't be able to keep up and would get flung off. That was a, not necessarily legit, legitimate, but it was an argument at the time. By finding moons around Jupiter, what Galileo was able to show people is that no matter what is at the center of the solar system, Jupiter has moons that go around it as it also go around, goes around that object, which means that that isn't a valid argument against one or the other model. Plus, it was just really interesting. Um, I don't have specific pictures um, in these slides of his little um, picture of the uh, rings around Saturn, and he didn't actually know that they were rings. He could just tell that they were like two blobs on either side of the um, planet of Saturn, which was one more of these celestial objects that wasn't this perfect sphere, but was more interesting than perfect. And he's, he found spots on the sun, and we will be talking about that in section or chapter, um, chapter 15. And so we'll have lots of pictures of sunspots there, and we'll talk about his observations at that point too. Now, beyond that initial list of five things, the most important of all of Galileo's um, observations was the phases of Venus beyond just a crescent shape. Now, this little figure here shows um, a kind of simplified example of Venus going around the sun. And when it is kind of near us and near the sun, it has a little crescent shape lit up. We would only see that little crescent shape if we zoomed in on it with our telescope. As it gets farther away from us and further around in its orbit, either side of the sun, we would be able to see a half circle. Um, and so we would be able to see more of Venus lit up. Further back, we would be able to see a even more than half circle. It's a gibbous shape. We'll learn that word in chapter four. And then on the far side of the sun, although we wouldn't be able to see it because the sun would be in the way, we would have a full moon or full Venus phase um, if the sun weren't in the way for us to be able to look at it. The link here is a really useful um, clickable animation too for the Venus phases. And so it's something that um, I highly recommend you play around with on your own. The really key thing about the phases of Venus is the way that the geocentric model worked, shown here on the left of the slide. 
is that Venus was always forced to be in between the sun and the earth as the sun went around the earth in the geocentric model, which meant that we would only ever be able to see the crescent shape. But by being able to show others, anyone who had their own telescope, he could just say, look at Venus over the course of um, several weeks. You'll see these different phases. That's only possible if Venus is allowed to go fully around the sun as we are also going fully around the sun. And so the observations of Venus's phases were, um, it was the final nail in the coffin of the geocentric universe model. No one could keep holding on to that incorrect idea with such a clear proving it wrong um, observation in front of them. Now, certainly this was not without um, some pushback. Uh, so within 40 years of those observations of the phases of Venus, only the heliocentric universe model was taught. But um, when Galileo published his um, big book, and it was um, written as a dialogue between several different characters, he had gone through the whole censorship process that Italy had in place at the time. It was a religious-based censorship. And he had gotten permission from the local censor in Florence and the head censor in the Vatican in 1630. But in the um, following two years, people in charge kind of changed. And so people who weren't as um, willing to have the unquestionable truth of the Earth-centered universe questioned, um, charged him with disobeying a papal decree from 1616. So Galileo was never charged with heresy, um, but he was sentenced to house, um, house arrest. He was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in house arrest and was forbidden from um, publishing anything else relating to astronomy and the heliocentric model. So he did write up a lot of his like simple physics experiments, um, and a lot of that led to our understanding of physics as we know it and Isaac Newton's ability to do anything. Um, but it's it's still something where you really wonder what we could have had um, if it weren't for that uh, situation. All of his books were on the Catholic Church's, the Roman Catholic Church's forbidden list until 1836. And there was a special commission put together by the Vatican in 1992 that retroactively found, um, retroactively found Galileo innocent. Um, basically, they finally admitted that they were wrong hundreds of years later. Doesn't really do Galileo much good, but it's a step in the right direction. In the next video that we have, we will be talking about... Um, other scientists who were working at roughly the same time, time frame, so uh, Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler, and also in chapter three coming up in a couple of videos, we'll be talking about Isaac Newton, who based a lot of his understanding and his work on the um, work that Galileo did. So I will see you in those videos.